Hello everyone, today we talk again about the Longobard settlement in the Italian peninsula. It's a topic that uh, I've covered multiple times from different perspectives, both from the Byzantine history series and also from a general point of view. I've never gone in, in deeper detail. In fact, I think this is going to be one of the last uh, videos that I make in general on this topic that happened literally randomly, right? Of all the videos we could make, it always the, the moment of the settlement um, uh, popped out in, in my magical, you know, decision-making uh, by chance. And yet it's a topic that I realize you're interested uh, in for some reason. Some of you say, oh, you know, I'll go on with the Longbird uh, history playlist. And you know that, if you remember, since the beginning that I actually uh, started with with Longbird history in my uh, curriculum back in the day at university way before I, I started Schwerpunkt actually but let's say it's one of those mom defining moments in European history that I think is not given too much um, you know relevance and or it's, it usually it's either interpreted as you know mostly mostly from the Byzantine side right you know the the idea that the Byzantine restoration of the uh, social system that had already been shaken in this pretty troubled and never-ending war uh, against the Goths um, was was com seriously compromised by the Longobard settlement in Italy, and therefore people say, "Oh well, that's kind of the end of uh, of late antiquity, at least in the West." The Longobards uh, destroyed everything. That's the, the view that nobody believes in. I had the privilege of studying, actually, with some of the, if not the greatest experts in Longobard history existing at this point. Uh, there are beautiful works written by Wickham on the same period, also about Byzantine Italy, for, for that matter. And um, we have seen, generally speaking, in fact, both perspectives that we were saying before, and Go. In fact, I just created a Byzantine Italy playlist because there is somebody who asked me, and and so it's always looking at both sides in a way. But it's probably the Longobard perspective that is missing in a way. The Longobards are not particularly, you know, popular in in historical culture uh, nowadays, right? It seems like yes, there may be videos on them, things like that, but like, there's not a great audience interest in them for for some reason. Maybe I. Uh, filled that niche, and so uh, also I got several, you know, thousand views on, on these videos. And I understand it's because there is a legitimate curiosity, right? On the other hand, there is this idea, in fact, that the Longobards just were brutal Germans uh, that just ruined the Roman civilization, or whatever. This is a, a completely and factually incorrect uh, historiographical interpretation. In fact, the the bigger picture that, as I was saying before, we have paradoxically almost never covered, that is the probably the state building of the um, uh, Longobard kingdom, and m especially its development too, uh, till the 8th century, and, and its legacy beyond, that I made some video on, especially juridically wise, but also in the Carolingian history uh, hi perspective, let's say, is completely neglected. That is to say, in the West, I think nowadays, the realization that there was a Longobard kingdom that was essentially the single most civilly developed in Western Europe in early medieval times, in, among the Romano-Germanic peoples, is a completely unknown concept. It's a completely alien concept. People say, but no, Longobards were, were, were Germans, were rough, were tribesmen, were warriors. You know, they didn't kind of create, they, they did create a freaking state, uh, and a freaking literate one, right, with dukes that knew how to administer law, with uh, a, a, a function, the only functional elective monarchy that I that I know of in that mess that the Latin Germanic kingdoms otherwise actually were, um, they were civilly light ahead of the Franks when they came to conquer the land, that in fact, you know, when the invaders attached an enormous importance administratively in the, within the Carolingian Empire to the Italic Kingdom, and we've seen it often, um, in fact, in that regard. But th this concept that there was actually an advanced state at this point in history, in this place, is kind of, nobody cares. And nobody cares, of course, because most people that 
are interested in migration era are there because they're kind of even mentally primitive in the, the guise of you know the barbarians who arrive and finally destroy those damn romans and that's the only uh horizon that they follow most of the times and generally speaking probably the the nature of politics even of war per se and of society as as a broader intertwinement is complete completely alien to them so there are some interpretational problems uh though that we always face in early medieval times whenever we look at uh, realities that indeed are not particularly documented um, we should make perhaps an excursus that I will spare you for this video at least because it's going to be probably excruciatingly long as all things make about the longbirds um, regarding the historiography of the period that is what, what are the sources that we're looking at because let's say from the longbird side up to the 8th century fundamentally we don't have any substantial historiographical work that kind of backs I mean it's mostly Paul the Deer let's be honest there are other minor sources of course here and there also the Byzantine ones are useful the papal ones indeed we get a lot but let's say for, for their perspective and what were the the mechanisms let's say that granular view of the even the process of the settlement the arrangement with with the Byzantine Empire that probably occurred because this was not really you know a, um, a war declared by the Longbirds uh, on on the Romans. As a matter of fact, the, the more it goes on, even though there is no evidence, this doesn't mean anything actually, um, considering the times and the places. There are actually even some of the most highly documented in relative terms in, in the West or in, in history at that point, um, show that um, indeed there was probably an agreement. That is to say, the Longbirds were allowed by the Byzantines in to Italy for that reason. I re-uploaded um, a vid uh, the, the video recently uh, about the, the 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 fear, let's say the Atlantic perspective that the Byzantines had towards the Franks that were already at that point quite uh, you know imperialistically and monarchically um, structured and hadn't the longer birds come into Italy, objectively would have clashed against the Byzantines way before um, Car the Carolingian period and this entails all a series of relations also with the Longobards that today we can't go in detail. I made, again, videos you can find that in the Longobard history playlist, but we will come back in detail again on them because they're very important. There is all the phase, the initial phase when the Longobards uh, recompacted their own um, polity in, in, a, in fact, in a proper monarchy after the, the, the period of the so-called ducal anarchy. That I think today we won't even reach um, because that started from 574 when uh, Clef was killed and was uh, Albuvin's successor. Uh, we'll see it another time. But the, the, at that point, the Franks uh, and the Byzantines invaded jointly the Po Valley to try to get rid of the Longobards, and these stood, they entrenched themselves in the Roman cities. Um, they, they managed to carry out guerrilla, and there was also you know, plague spreading among the, the Frankish Byzantine armies that they didn't reconnect. So it's a very interesting period that, again, we haven't descended in the details of yet, but it's mostly like that's how we should study history in the first place. So I, I feel a Schwerpunkt is, after all, still an infant, right? It's just, you know, four years old at this point, and so there is time <laughs> for learning and improvement and growing, and hopefully we'll get there. Uh, at some point, um, I could even start that because again, I, I wrote a 160 pages thesis about them, and mostly from a military point of view, from the from Germany to the end of of the kingdom, and so I could simply read that. Given that it's mine, it's you know my my own copyright. I can literally paste and copy the whole script, and I. Uh, and there is really a lot. And that's even a concise version of the wall. For example, all the fortifications were established uh, across um, the Italian mainland, but also especially uh, along um, across the Alpine Arc. That was important, especially in the relation with the Franks, as we will see in part also today. So there is really, really a lot to tell. But the, the main problems lay mostly in the fact that we don't know 
more than much. And yet there are some hints that show us that this settlement in the following period was were not at all a dramatic moment for uh, for Italy specifically, because um, the wars had happened during the Gothic War, and mostly because the Byzantines had also screwed up, because they had basically defeated the Goths, but they, they lowered the guard at the very end, and so these uh, people, you know, were reconquered, basically, the, the whole peninsula, they were, you know, the armies made back and forth twice, or thrice, all, all, all across uh, latitudinally. That's what effectively destroyed the country, at least the, the late antique one as we know it, and that's where the Longobards kind of settle in. Uh, creating indeed a fracture, uh, let's say, with the Roman world, but a fracture that shouldn't be intended, in fact, in a catastrophic sense from a material point of view, because most of the things had already been destroyed first, and secondly, the actual destructions were carried out in, in Byzantine held territory, that is to say, of course, where the Longobards settled, we, we don't have any evidence of destruction, as a matter of fact, and that's pretty obvious, by the way, and this is valid also for the other Germanic migrations. Of course, they destroyed where they, when they raided around in the place they had to just pass by, where they had to settle would have been pretty idiotic, and of course, it, they didn't do. Um, there were front, There was a lot of frontier warfare, and that was mostly the reason why certain areas kind of were at some point uh, ruining even in the course of the period but you know that the 6th the 7th century are a moment of brutal contraction all over Europe at this point both the Merovingians the same Byzantines etc are shrinking if you look at the even at the size of the armies right there you, you, you realize I don't know that the Frankish army passed things that could be uh, comparable to, to a Roman field army, 30,000 men, and also with an important, in fact, Roman hardware and logistics and artillery, etc., to essentially hunting parties, that is to say the Merovingians began to kill each other among siblings, uh, let's say just as if they had to go hunting a boar, and that's that, that the size of their, their unit. So, there's a massive, this is not, of course, trying to make historical materialism, but that, that's an indicator of the, the contraction. And, of course, the reasons of those are not just even environmental, it's that they had been fighting a lot and they had been destroying a lot. Uh, indeed, humans can mess up things pretty well by themselves without even the help of climate or any, you know, pathogen, whatever. Um, so... The Longobard history must be approached seriously, with competence, with information, with sources, and not just by, you know, uh, wishful thinking or f looking at this as a kind of a clash of civilization or whatever, but also because the Longobards dramatically benefited, of course, from the, um, from the Italian experience as a people. I mean, they, they civilized, they, and in fact, they created something that was way more advanced than anything that existed in, in Western Europe at that point. So we will see that in another period, in another video. Um, and so this, um, the, the Longobard invasion and settlement definitely does take place in, a, in the frame of this Byzantine attempt of restoring Roman rule in Italy. And that was the unavoidable uh, land to control for any Roman emperor, guess why? And um, yet, as you know, Justinian's uh, efforts came to be, you know, uh, be a, an enormous, first of all, they had to, ha to have an enormous cost, and much of this cost in perspective, but not really because the, the choice was wrong per se. I'm actually very sympathetic and towards, I mean, politically and strategically to what the Justinian and Reconquest was, right? Nobody would expect a, a freaking pandemic would arrive um, in the meanwhile. And, and you know, who are we to, you know, to tell them after what, what just happened? Um, and the, 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 the consequences, therefore, are always unpredictable. And the idea of reconquering the Mediterranean and this Roman lands were, were obvious necessity and benefit for, for an empire like the one of Constantinople. Uh, but again, things had gone downhill. The Gothic War especially was mishandled dramatically. 
um, this compromised, in fact, the same possibility of restoring that late antique uh, system that, in, up to that point in Italy, even under the Ostrogoths, as you know very well, they had military administration, while the Roman senators had a civil one uh, the same, in the same place, um, had coexisted, was the most successful Romano-Germanic coexistence that we can date, and a moment of, of stability and prosperity, at least up until Theodoric reigned. Um, so, the Longobards have arrived, and the Longobards are objectively something else, right? They had been in movement for centuries, at some point I will make a video on the Longobard migration. They had, uh, migrations say better, because they, they were kind of, um, uh, for the, the Longobards historically didn't quite have a, uh, a monarchy per se, right? There were attempts probably at some point during... The course of the migration, the, the legions are difficult even to chronologically set a standard, but let's say between the, the, se the, the, the second, the third century, there had been kind of an attempt uh, among the Longbirds to, to create a, a, king, uh, a monarchy, but the, the people, this is this is about the Longbirds, they were quite strong, right? They, in, in the entire Longbird tradition and mythology and culture, the middle classes were strong. Right, the Longbird mythology is not a mythology of kings like the one of the Ostrogoths. It's a mythology of people. Right, they are some of the, are really some of the probably hardest Germanic stock culturally speaking. That was to to survive in that guise for for centuries. Right, and to even though creating a monarchy, eventually a successful one in Italy, was a completely different situation from the Barbaricum. And even though the Romans, as we'll see now, had kind of um, diplomatically and kind of created some sort of you know monarchic direction of the people the uh, the general feeling and identity of the Longbirds stood in the f uh, freedom of their own uh, of their own middle class in, the, in its prosperity which is something with that helped them a big deal especially in war in their path especially in, in Pannonia where they clashed against the Japanese managed to defeat them the Japanese were much more they, they were much more kind of Eastern Germanic, uh, kind of even Hunnic influence. They they had gathered after, they, they had, you know, defeated the Huns themselves. They had, they were quite of a people, but their elites were uh, uh, narrow and uh, at the same time overwhelmingly rich, while the rest of the people were kind of poorer. So this uh, facilitated essentially the, the longer bird task because they had a much bulkier uh, core right of of well uh, armed and and militarily active warriors that so we see we did we, we understand this archaeologically speaking christy made interesting studies about this um and that is in fact something that we see also in italy afterwards and um and in properly in the longobard culture even the elective monarchy in this orderly frame that they were able to give themselves meeting a concept of romanization in a, in a country that was at that point um, unhinged from the ancient latifundia system that had collapsed during the Gothic War. So there were in Italy lots of small and medium uh, landowners that at that point bought into the Longbird formula of autonomous families living on their own um, uh, autonomously and freely providing for themselves. Uh, that was the, the the opposite formula to what he said in Byzantine Italy uh, was was maintained at least in part, meaning that even there the Latifundium had collapsed um, in at least from, from previous times. It, it had been, however, partly restored and maintained in, in ways that, however, came to be blurred at some point, depending on the place, especially because of the same Longobard proximity. But also the decentralization from Const uh, from Constantinople, because at that point the Byzantines were soon absorbed in much greater problems, especially in the east, and so Italy became kind of a secondary uh, province, like a, a periphery that the the same Byzantines didn't care too much uh, about, if not for the connection with the papacy, the control of, of the coasts mostly, um, whereas the the Italic interland was essentially Germanized in culture uh, because of this Longobard model 
that was offered and I explained countless times that in the 19th century the nationalist uh, historiography believed that the Longobards had arrived and basically enslaved everybody, right? All the Romans didn't know it, because they, in, in the later centuries, they were just kind of Germanic names, or at least, you know, people are evidently connected to, to the Longobard, um, you know, uh, identity per se, in the work in, in, the, in the charters, in the documents. Again, it was highly literate by the 8th century. Um, and economically dynamic, and the reason being not that the Romans had disappeared and that were hidden somewhere. This is something that even Manzoni wrote, and that he, he, in earnest, he was even a good, not just a, a great uh, man of letters, but also a good historian, considering the times. And um, and it was wrong. We discovered that what had happened already by essentially the the seventh, the, 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 the mid seventh century, that. Everybody that lived in the Longobard Kingdom had become juridically de facto a Longobard, right? And so it, the only Romans that we find just later, in the 8th century, are the ones, in fact, of the Byzantine lands that the Longobards came to acquire in consistent fashion, especially the ones uh, of the Pentapolis uh, and the uh, the Exarchate that uh, the the that were had remained Romans juridically, and at some point the Longobards just took over and then styling themselves, think about Heistulf as a king properly, uh, king of the Longobards, and essentially protector of the Romans. And this story tells, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the, the enormous success that the Longobard political, institutional, juridical, administrative system had all over the peninsula and how they were basically taking it over before the, um, the Franks uh, arrived. But how also, as we were saying before, how much legacy was maintained in the Carolingian Empire, given that Italy was the only other kingdom, other the Frankish one, the others, the other lands were never recognized as such, because they were, um, again, the, the, the Franks had a, a great opinion of the long, but basically the only people that they estimated in, in among all the others they had encountered, because they knew, as a matter of fact, they had maintained that, in spite of this great civil advancement, a complete German culture. That is to say, of course, they wrote in Latin, they legislated in Latin and everything, again, but they were the Longbirds, were not some kind of half, say, all the other Romano-Germanic kingdoms had, in a way or another, kind of inspired themselves to the Roman imperial model. We ran up, up, even up to the Anglo-Saxons at some point. The Longbirds had never done that, in part because they were just next to the Byzantines, and so they were claiming their their own prerogatives in Italy that they defined immediately as kind of their own that they were their own was the styled properly the Regnum Totius Italia that is to say the the kingdom of, of all Italy right to properly say that's our aim that's our goal and never style themselves in a kind of way that could make them compromise with um, a Roman imperial subjection right uh, of their own people and that that was highly uh, there, there is a lot behind this because even the foundation of the longer kingdom was sung in the sagas Aldovin, as you know is a hero of the church and 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 we I, I don't think we understand up to which point it was important for this people to have settled in the heartland what had been the the original roman lands right so again things that we cannot feel let's say as easily today, but that for the time beings were really a big deal. In fact, what surprises me of, of the fact of how much the Longobards are neglected is exactly this perspective that goes in parallel with the idea that, you know, the Western Roman Empire ends and so everybody thinks on, on their own, right? Uh, there is no center. Actually, Italy was still considered as the center of the story, right? In many ways, because Rome was there, if anything, it was central for all uh, the Christians in Western Europe, and they, uh, so for all the Romano-Germanic kingdoms, uh, the connections with the Carolingian Empire was quite, quite close. Longobards were these kind of medium in a way, and also this example of Germanity, let's say, that that had still won the prize over, and so hence the, 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 the answering importance of the Italic Kingdom in the Carolingian institution, system, and all these things, the 
the crown, the imperial crown connected to, to that kingdom, by the way, not to the Frankish one. That, that's, that's quite a thing, if you think about that. Um, because that change that passed from the Western Frankish kingdom to Eastern Frankish kingdom, but it was not institutionally important. Nobody had connected it to that. It could be somebody else who could get the title. Right? But I if you weren't Italic king, you couldn't. And that would remain, in fact, in the Holy Roman Empire, the system. And much of this is owed to the, to the Longobard themselves, uh, in a sense. Um, of course, at the... Um, Begin, I say, at the moment of the invasion, the Longbirds were something, as we were saying before, something really different, that probably also defined this 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 difference in a way. They their migration was, after all, quite um, machinous, uh, but straightforward. They 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 just rose up the uh, Elbe River Valley. They reached uh, Moravia fundamentally. Uh, then the Middle Danube, and so that's where they entered. Actually, the the Roman uh, the Roman raider for us to to know anything about them historically, because basically the last information that we had them was when they had participated to a raid in the second half of the second century A.D. together with the Marcoman, if I'm not wrong, and on the Danube, and they had been defeated. By the way, it, you don't hear from them anymore. But the longer birds, albeit small, the 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 Roman historians said back in the day that they were extremely fierce. They were called as f more ferocious than Germanic ferocity. And they, after the assassination of Hermann, uh, they, they, and, and the fall of the Karuski, they, they seemingly got some, you know, they kept things under control in Germany at the time, which for such a small tribe. But such a warlike one still means that they were recognized in a way in this uh, already by the Germanic standards of the time. It's kind of truer Germans that culturally, institutionally, and militarily than else. As you know, they were a Vodanic people. They had assumed their the, 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 that nickname essentially because of of Vodan's uh, beard, um, and they the, there is something in their origin, in their mythology. They were part of the Germanic Dioscuri, the, the Vinili and the the Vinil and Vandil were the the in fact the the Vin and the, the Vinili were the older Longobards before they styled themselves like that. The the, Vin, the the Vandils are the Vandals, and in fact there is some connection there even in the um, in the myth of the origin when they cross from Scandinavia into. Rugen, we think, actually, where they met the Vandals and they crushed them because they asked them to, to pass and they, they didn't want to, they had to pay a tribe. So the Longobards divinely actually devote themselves to Voden, who gives them victory and calls them, like, with his name. And beautiful things, again, we could go in detail these things just in a single video, but... Um, and there is some truth to that, because the Longobards were one of the few Germanic peoples that actually kept their own ethnonym throughout history, right? When you think about the Franks, the Alemanni, the, the, even the Goths, these were names that were created uh, afterwards, in a sense. They were con confederal names. They were international shout-outs. The Longobards instead called themselves seemingly like that since even before Christ, because when Tiberius defeated them on the Elbe River, when the Romans conquered Germany, um, they, um, they were called by by Tacitus with, with their name and but by other authors with their name so they they were already called like that which is weird because none of the tribes basically of those times survived in name uh, the, uh, they flowed into these other you know conglomerations but they didn't save their name so that tells probably the fact that the Longbirds were really uh, a relatively small people but still uh, an incredibly tough nut to crack because they were particularly warlike, and it was something about their military nature that had more than just, in fact, a political meaning. There was something probably magical considered about their essence. And for this reason, the Longobards do have this fame of ferocity that, of course, already, like by the late empire at this point, could be remembered even by reading the, the classical sources. Um, in the Middle Danube, uh, so we're talking about the 5th, the 6th century, they had come with this mm, 
ferocity and but still kind of instability right it, it, within the germanic world um these were some of the most still kind of politically loose populations they kind of had the, this own identity on their own they had gathered peoples uh people along the way right do we know it even from their mythology etc they had enlarged their ranks but in this sense they were um they were kind of open right it was not much of a clear definition of a hierarchy as we've seen it was not properly a kingdom also the longbirds were among the least familiar uh germans in in relation with the sedentary communities of the uh, mediterranean and the romano celtic area especially compared to the Goths that instead had been involved in the you know in the affairs of the Roman Empire from quite a while and they had thus uh, you know more Romanized especially what called the Visigoths uh, the Ostrogoths maybe this is uh, kind of um, overrated in a sense but definitely they were something else they had a Romano Hunnic especially experience also the Longbirds had a Hunnic experience at the well, northwestern fringes of the Hunnic Empire, and they probably s remained even under the Huns after Attila's death for for a longer time, and this did confer them some kind of feature that we see even in their uh, military, you know, aspect in a sense, even in the ar arms and armor, and some certain zootechnic capacity, the obsession for a mounted combat, even though they didn't like th this is another thing i discussed elsewhere but say um the importance of cavalry as we've seen many times studying the origins of chivalry was something all indo-european peoples were radically obsessed with even those who made uh, after all small use of them everybody was obsessed with the uh, with the equestrian model of the hero right the romans the greeks the germans the celts everybody right they had it in their veins but the, the Longobards probably acquired some s Sarmatic and Hunnic element that reinforced that in a higher sense, and even in a hierarchical sense. It's fair to say that the Longobards did fit by that point, mostly the group of Germans who had been Hunnicized, let's say, rather than Romanized in terms of influences. Um, however, when they settled in Pannonia, they also they became Federati of the Empire, Federati Simmacoi, that point uh with constantinople uh at the time of justinian um and they acquired said that they were important in the balance on in the area especially to counter the Japans that had created an interesting uh power in the, the middle danube themselves in fact they began clashing against one another um and the longobards were employed also famously against the ostrogoths uh in italy in 552, that is the the the, uh, the year before the last of, of the Gothic War, when at the command of the Byzantine Army of Italy, uh, was uh, there was not Belisarius anymore, but Narses, uh, that actually got rid of the Longobard contingent as quickly as possible even though if i'm not wrong paul the deacon says something else they were gifted uh, to be sent home again and that that is kind of realistic if, uh, in the sense that Byzantines probably gave them something to, to go away more speedily uh, because they had experimented their unruliness and excess wildness if you want and these peoples indeed as we were saying before they had always lived in in the barbaricum Pannonia at the time had been severely de-Romanized. The, the Romans, of course, overlapped partly with that. There were some Romans also within their ranks, uh, indeed. Um, but, uh, let's say, the, the Pannonian plain had been severely, uh, you know, wildified further by the Huns, by all these movements of peoples, and kind of the Longbirds had never been, again, they'd never been civilized, never been under a, a, a fully sedentary reality of cities of letters or anything these were warlike peoples of the finest uh, you know and crudest kind 
um, who were indeed overly exalted by the idea of glory, of you know, conquest, of, of, of superiority, all these things. Um, and yet, well, they were politically fragmented in a way that the Byzantines themselves, as we were saying before, to, to rule them better, uh, instead of many different scattered clans, they kind of brought under this line that is eventually the, the one the one of Albuvin, right, and his father as primarily, and they were kind of uh, first among equals from from a Germanic perspective, right, and naturally they would mostly be aiming at kind of a kind of a, mo of a monarchy. But again, the Longobard people was socially organized in a way that di didn't uh, allow essentially the elites to claim a monarchic status. They were quite strong in arms to prevent that. So in, in, in the Pannonian plain, the Longobards fought against the uh, Japheds, they, they had already fought against the Heruli, um, they, they had partly even been defeated at the beginning, then through Bodan's help in the myth, they, they managed to crash them, they, they fought against the Japheds, or Gapids if you prefer, say Gapids, um, they, um, they, they switched, uh, like um, Constantinople kind of supported one or the other in turn. Right, the Longobards were first allied with the Romans against the Gapids, then the Gapids were allied uh, uh, with the Romans against the Longobards, who allied themselves with the Abers, right, before the Longobards were also receiving some help with, by the Thuringians, by the way. Uh, they had generally stood previously in the... Uh, they were Aryan, by the way, so they they had generally stood with the Gothic, uh, Gothic axis uh, of Theodoric, um, given that they lived, by the way, at the outskirts of the of the Ostrogothic power in the uh, across the Danube, right? So they they were part of that group that had originally sided with with the um, with the pagan and Aryan idea, as opposed to the Roman Catholic one pursued by the Merovingians, who were threatening the same pagan Germany. Hence the Thuringians as well. So hence the the, conne the connections there. Eventually, when the Goths were destroyed, the Longobards kind of gained uh, power in, in turn because, of course, the Goths were kind of wiped out. They they had more free maneuvered, um, even in the these territories at that point were at the front, at the, at the frontier, far from both from Constantinople and at that point no, no Ostrogothic kingdom anymore. In fact participating even to its demise under Roman command. Um, and, um, and, and the Italian experience was very important in the war because the Longobards learned what the land was about. We know that Longobards probably participated with some picked units, with some, um, some noblemen, probably with some retinues. Uh, in a kind of proto-feudal fashion, they um, they evaluated what the Italian peninsula was about, whether it was permeable, what they could gain from an eventual settlement there. So they got they they began to, to toy with the idea of an, of occupying it. Also, they came back to Pannonia from the same from the same uh, through the same route that they would use to invade Italy from the other sense through no the northeast, etc. So they remember the places. They also had connections with the same uh, Ostrogoth survivors because when the Ostrogoths were crushed actually some of their um, colonies in northern Italy were left by the Byzantines there as uh, as guards as basically as, uh, li like it happened in Africa with the Vandals uh, right etc. Some relics of these populations especially in the most frontier kind of area like the north uh, was becoming at that point a you know, militarized sense could garrison the place and these Ostrogoths eventually would would essentially join the Longobards uh, at the time of the invasion and essentially becoming losing their uh, their national identity but becoming Longobard uh, in turn but th there was this kind of continuity and um, in uh, 567 the Longobards managed to crush the Gapids, uh, which uh, kind of brought them more decisively against the Byzantines, uh, 
given that they were that the, as we've seen the Gepids were Roman allies and also the Longobards had allied themselves with the Avars that were this quite um, you know hell of a people that came from under Turkic pressure from the steppes north of the Caucasus and that were at the time in full expansion along the Danube which naturally alarmed the Byzantines uh, and the Longobards as well. Regarding this, the, on, in history books you always find this this thing that is uh, the Longobards uh, were pushed by the Avars into Italy. This is actually not true, right? This is not showed by any evidence. The, the Avars were still uh, were st by that time were still uh, divided in various clans that were not the later Khaganate that would be able to besiege Constantinople and everything. So, uh, of course, um, the Longobards were not kind of happy to share uh, you know the, the Pannonian plain with the Avars also because these would settle more or less in the same areas where the Gepids had been settled but it was still kind of a too disorderly situation to compact the you know the Avars in a excessively dangerous fashion against the Longobards right so the myth that you know the Avars arrive as a superpower is pushed the Longobards away it's, it's actually not present as a matter of fact the Longobards made before migrating to Italy made an agreement with the Avars that um, t said that uh, if the, lo the migration had failed the Longobards could come back to the Pannonian plain and the Avars would have, have to render them the places it's kind of interesting. Of course, it tells a history of conflict, and of course, they didn't like each other uh, very much. But we are far from kind of a you know decisive cause-effect connection, right? The the cause of the Longobard migration in Italy was much more evident and uh, connected to the the obvious fact that they were kind of a warlike people at this point gathering also other elements because together with the Longobards that were the majority migrated in Italy lots of other people uh, there were 20,000 Saxons the Longobards in fact are very connected to the Saxons they basically uh, you know that they gave ground to them when when they migrated from the upper Elbe River uh, in fact, the in today's Germany in Lüneburg, the Bardengau seemingly maintains the that Longobard ethnonym because some Longobards remain in Germany, by the way. And from some, uh, say, DNA studies, we have seen that um, the, the there are striking similarities between some elements of Longobard descent and the the Anglo-Saxons, the British, the English. So the um, this is important because uh, objectively they were related in a way and they were allies with the Saxons that came to Italy by the way to settle. The Longobards tell them you, you settle but you have to become Longobard, you have to lose your Saxon identity. So they came, the Saxons said no and they came back to Germany. But there were Thuringians, there were Swabians. We know that because for example some later kings, for example Agilulf later was of Thuringian origin the Duke of Turin. Um, there were some Longobards also that when they settled in Italy eventually passed to the Byzantine side there were some Swabians. Famously enough there were so Longobard commanders in the Balkans um, reached uh, important levels in the hierarchy in the Byzantine army. We know of many Longobards uh, from Italy that were brought f uh, by the Byzantines to to Armenia to fight in the Caucasus. Um, so because they made war well, so they were, they were of use, and there were lots of them. In fact, when you read the Strategicon and uh, considering the times um, of Maurice, or uh, right around there, uh, many people say, "Oh, this is Strategicon, the, the passage on the blonde-haired peoples is talking essentially about the Franks." As a matter of fact, there were, were few relations with the Franks. First of all, the blonde-haired peoples there is broader synecdoche for. Um, for the Germanic peoples in general, and and the greatest Germanic element in the Byzantine army at the time was the Longobard one. So actually, we're mostly talking about. That. I mean, there wouldn't be a dramatic difference. It's a broader, you know, ethnographical inquiry rather than just a military manual. But it, it, the Longobards are overlooked in in that in that regard. But there were uh, not just Germans. There were also some Slavs already because in Moravia they were already permeating with the Longobards were namely there ruling there uh, there were some Avars of course there were other Turkic elements Huns etc um, and the 
the op so this was a the long bird migration was big. We're talking about probably the largest. Uh, the the Ostrogothic and the Longobard ones were the largest migrations of, uh, in uh, and they they all they were both connected to Italy in that regard because people came from everywhere. The Longobards are estimated realistically at one hundred thousand, which is a lot for the time. It still would make for like one um, uh, uh, from one to three percent of the Italian population, right? Not. Uh, not a huge thing, but some areas were ethnically impacted, especially in in the northeast, um, along the Apennine, it was less populated. In fact, th this can still be seen in modern Italian um, phenotypes, because in the areas, for example, around uh, Spoleto or Benevent, there were, were Longbird Dutch, you see there was literally a, a pool of uh, blonder people on average than the... And you wouldn't connect it otherwise. Um, the majority settled in the Po Valley, as we'll see now, but they scatter pretty much all over the peninsula. Sometimes they crossed even, some went to Gaul, they were crushed actually. But um, the the idea is that these were a, a very large amount of people, so they had a, a military power because, by the way, their male uh, freemen were, were, were in arms, right? By the way, the Longobards had incorporated part of the, of the Gepids, um, f famously enough, Alpavin had killed the Longbeard King and, you know, essentially taken his daughter. And uh, so there were the Gepids as well coming you know, to Italy, etc. And there were a lot. And uh, Byzantine Italy was notoriously exhausted by the war, by the plague, by famine. So it, it was kind of obvious that these people could simply march in the peninsula. They. As far as we understand there, we, 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 we know that Longbirds were not completely sure like that things would succeed because probably they realized also that they were kind of not politically compact enough. Uh, and in fact, this would be a problem for them, especially at the beginning. It would probably confer a specific character to the, to the invasion uh, and the settlement too, um, as we'll see. But they they probably negotiated this thing with the Romans. The proof being, first of all, this. When the Longbirds migrated into Italy, there was no thing like uh, a Byzantine field army there. Not only, when they migrated, um, Constantinople did nothing. Right, so many people said, but wait a second, you know, this is a major invasion in Italy that you spent all those years fighting for, and it's... Uh, and, and the Byzantine Empire doesn't even make a, a minimal sign of reacting. So we think quite easily, by the way, that the thing was negotiated and that the eventually the forms that the Longobard settlement took were, you know, kind of the Byzantines losing control of that in a way, but still maintaining part of it. And this is evident, especially when the Longobards began to try to create something more autonomous if not independent in Italy in the guise of a kingdom and lots of Longobards were literally from the Byzantine side in fact uh, originally the, the Longobards in, in a monarchic sense had to fight more against other Longobards than against the Byzantines in some instances uh, Authory mm, at the end of the of the 6th century established the Longobard kingdom by decapitating most of the of the Longobard chieftains that had settled in 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 the in the Po Valley, there was a they were opposing him. In the establishment of a market, and they were fighting for the Byzantines in that sense. Um, so the Longobards migrated into Italy under the guide of King Alban, that is one of the great heroes of the sagas. He's considered one of great wars and so on. He has all the tragic destiny and the wars he had fought and killed enemy kings you know, in the quite uh, romantic and uh, heartwarming tradition of you know decapitating them and making of their skull a cup with which they would drink from because they thought that uh, essentially that's where the, the power of the warrior stood and so if you drank from their skull it was not much of an offense actually a compliment they would have never drank from the skull of a slave right it would have been those were not even people uh, in, in their view um, only the big ones that could cumulate the power 
uh, of the, the summing the, the, the warrior's powers by, by drinking from this cup. Um, and so, um, this Albavin was surely a, a great leader who managed to uh, excite the, the fantasies of these wars and telling, oh, let's go in Italy, it's a rich place, uh, we, we, there is loot and land for, for everybody and all this stuff. And, uh, and so, the Longobards were galvanized at the idea. But the, the problem was also that Albavin was negotiating with the Byzantines for a more or less orderly settlement to, to maintain kind of a minimal control in certain areas. And he evidently identified the Po Valley where probably also the Byzantines would have liked the Longbirds to stay, to be kind of a buffer state against Merovingian expansionism, so controlling the Alpine passes and maintaining this core of warlike peoples, hopefully just north. But given that political social articulation of the Longbird people, um, there was no real cohesion or unity. In fact, the Longbirds migrated without a clear uh, strategical plan uh, in the peninsula. Considering their numbers, if they had been cohesive, they would they would have taken over the entire peninsula immediately. Because again, the, aside from garrisons, was not even properly a, a Roman army they are defending. Um, but what really happened is that the various Longobard dukes at the hand of the Fare, the that is, it's the Fahrgemeinschaft, is the idea of properly a community on 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 the road, <laughs> or you know, not even road, considering <laughs> some places, but um, that remains in the Italian toponyms. You know, that there are these fares still that are the, the trace of the fact that Longbirds settled in those in those towns. Um, that began, in fact, to settle pretty much everywhere. Like they would carve their own s little lordship here and there. Uh, very often, it, it was on a city because Italy at that point was just uh, every political ecclesiastical district was gravitating around the city, so they actually settled, they urbanized immediately, even though many people lived outside the city walls as, as well and maintained kind of a times more regional lifestyle. This is especially true of north, northeastern Italy, to what would be known as the Longobard Austria, that remained for that, was less urbanized and remained for that reason kind of more historically you know, the the hardcore, uh, you know, land of Longobardness, let's say. Also because it was at the frontier with the Slavs, with the Avars, it was kind of a militarized area. Um, for the rest, Albuvin and the most powerful dukes chose the Roman places, of course. In fact, the heartland of the Longobards, from which, in fact, the, the, the same modern name of Lombardy comes from, was, as we will see later better, uh, this area, the, the capital would be uh, Pavia, but we're talking also about cities like Milan or other important centers of Romanness that, in fact, are witnessed also in Longobard, uh, in the Longobard monarchy where they came to rule from, also by this evident Romanization in in the iconography, in the titles, in etc. They, I don't know, uh, in Milan, the Longobard kings would watch the chariot races still so the, the kind of degree of kind of romano-germanic coexistence in spite of the fact that these cities had declined severely during the gothic war but still there were roman elites that taught these people also how to do it right and so after a couple of generations it would be the edict of rotary written in latin for the administration of the land that lasted impressively for in use for centuries to testify it's in, in, a, in a very you know complex and de developed dynamic like the Italian one by the way that witnesses how intelligent and how um, functional that legislation was um, but for the rest uh, what we we're saying before is that the Longobards didn't didn't even have a real geographical understanding of the places they, they were I mean, these were clans that were habituated just to move in the realm of, I don't know, hundreds of kilometers normal, just for the raiding part, and then they would leave in shorter. They didn't know what Italy was. They didn't have, need a map or anything. So initially, they just went out there seeking for fortune or for loot. They didn't have a radical plan of elimination of the Byzantine domination either. They they couldn't. They wouldn't. There was no like 
As soon as they entered Italy, they, they were free to do whatever they wanted, in a sense. And so this lack of cohesion paradoxically prevented them from, um, from taking over the land entirely. In fact, some of them proceeded westwards up to crossing the Alps and uh, uh, aggressing the Franks, the Franco-Burgundians in the Rhone Basin that um, pushed them back at the hands, by the way, of a local, what seemingly still a Romano-Burgundian commander, by the way, that ambushed them quite cleverly. And thus, at that point, the Longobards occupied the uh, valleys of Susa and of Alstaot, right? And keeping them in the uh, centuries, right? And uh, those were the frontier properly with the Frankish world. And by the way, the, the Franks maintained the upper hand on the wo on from uh, the side of the watershed. Right, and this is in fact something that still remains in the border between France and Italy. That is, so normally, a country's border is between, like, there's a uh, the water, the, the mountain watershed, and you have from a country from one side to the other. But since uh, the Franks were more powerful, still, the French always maintained the upper hand, right up to almost the the plains in, in from the Italian side. And the Franks, in fact, were quite uh, resentful of this and they were you know they, they would invade the Po Valley at some point together with the Byzantines to trying to get rid of the Longbirds but it failed uh, in the we are talking about uh, it happened multiple times between the end of the 6th and the beginning of the 7th century um, naturally we're talking about more disorganized bands I mean uh, Everything was mixed. We can imagine this chieftains participated variously by habit, just of sending the the young uh, elements with other chieftains to 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 gain experience, skill in battle, and all these things. But it's obvious that the more powerful longbirds, including Alvin and his entourage, etc., occupied again the most important Roman cities of the north. And uh, I don't know. Verona was ruled by a nephew of Alvin that established there the, the command of the Longobard cavalry. By the way, the Marpais was the commander. This Longobard language is beautiful. It, it's unfortunately extinguished, but it was hissing like one of the snake of the primordial snakes of the Germanic mythology, and it was akin to today's Swabian and partly Bavarian. There were there were Elb, um, originally Elb um, Germanic uh, languages. The closest thing is some kind of Swabian dialect to the Longobards. There is something part maybe surviving in in the Alpine valleys that is called Alamannic, but uh, that that is is dying out really. But uh, it's basically it's kind of a, a linguistic museum for as far as we are concerned, because of course it doesn't speak the language of the time. It's something very close. It would have been spoken in the Middle Ages, similarly like. Um, uh, so the, the Longobards didn't make it to conquer the Exarchate uh, that was more or less today's uh, the, today's Romagnol province that uh, in fact takes the name from the fact that the Romans maintained control there and the w as you know the, the Exarchate of Ravenna was the uh, really the, the, the head of the Byzantine Italian government across the entire peninsula uh, without the islands and this was well fortified I mean it was the former uh, imperial capital as you know um, etc and I made a video on the settlement uh, that goes in detail uh, in greater detail than in this video so you can check that out in the Longbird history playlist uh, also the Byzantine history one um, but this settlement was so uh, kind of disorderly in a way that there were many different uh, sacks of Byzantine resistance that remained. For example, the Venetian lagoons, uh, uh, Istria, uh, also in the south, the Pentapolis, that is this uh, you know, coastal cities from uh, Ariminium to Ancona in the, would be today's marches on the Adriatic Sea. Uh, 
um, and some Longobard contingents moved across uh, the Apennine up to Lucania in southern Italy and the Ionian Sea, uh, but leaving to the Byzantines the course of the Tiber River, the Tiber Valley, and the entire uh, Lachial coast, the coast of Rome. Um, so also a great part of that countryside of, uh, of Apulia, that at the time the Byzantine administration was split between Apulia proper and Calabria, Calabria eventually came to, uh, that was still under Byzantine control, to in fact was known as Brutzium at the time, it would be called Calabria because in, late, in the high middle ages the Byzantines moved the administration of the southern uh, Apulia, today's Salento roughly, uh, and transferred in what is today's Calabria, got the name from there. But Longobards during the centuries would can expand importantly in these lands as well. Uh, also, the Longobards were not much of a maritime people, so that the Tyrrhenian islands remained under Byzantine control. However, um, there are interesting uh, sources documenting the fact that the Longobards did take the sea as pirates. In fact, they when they took uh, the city of 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 Pisa in its port, they found some uh, Byzantine dromons there, and they they got they used them right, probably also with the local crews, etc. And they began to raid uh, Sardinia. Uh, if I'm not wrong, there is uh, Gregory uh, Gregory the Great uh, Pope writing to the Bishop of of Color is telling him, watch out because there is this this Longobards around by sea. Also, in an unprecise time during the 7th century, the Longobards managed to occupy Corsica. That, I mean, didn't have really much there, but it still connected somewhat the, also the Tuscan and Ligurian um, ports. Uh, Liguria was uh, occupied by the Longobards uh, a bit before, in, in, six, in 643, by uh, the King Rotary. And... Uh, remained an important, in fact, mostly royal connection. In fact, the, the, the Longobard kingdom would um, would encompass all the Longobard lands in Italy that after the end of the 6th uh, century n uh, never contrarily wise, that's another stereotype and misconception uh, never, was never opposed by any Longobard, right? It was n not a Longobard from even the the south, etc. that said, no, I don't recognize the Longobard kingdom because it was first of all for them the Longobard people altogether and so they had the opportunity of participating to that and even in like in the cases of Spoleto that sometimes sided with the Byzantines etc it was never any secessionistic or say no you're, you're not my king anymore after Arthur made that bath of blood of the rebels nobody nobody in Longobard history ever uh, uh, opposed the kingdom per se Right. The only thing that happened maybe is at the very end of the kingdom when the la uh, last king Desiderius was elected by the Pope and the Franks that had almost essentially uh, taken over the the country and the Longobard Austria said no we don't recognize that king because it's been elected by somebody else but it's an exception that confirms the rule that in spite of the autonomy that some duchies enjoyed the Longobards did have a unity and the, the the myth is a complete misconception and um, basically a reference only to what is normally said about Longobard history in popular culture. It's the very beginning of Longobard history, very end of Longobard history, <laughs> yet the entire two centuries in the middle like do not exist, but whatever. And uh, this is for saying that the actual kingdom would have its um, mostly hardcore royally controlled through the Gassel date system, um, land mass in Lombardy, uh, Liguria and Tuscany, these were the, in fact the areas that would remain historical also the seats of the more uh, advanced communal development, the, the most urbanized ones, the richest ones, etc. But the control was soon extended, would be extended over the centuries on, on other important lengths, including the Exarchate, etc. Um, so at the beginning what turned out was uh, pretty messed up 
intertwinement of Longobard and Byzantine dominations in areas that remained like a big frontier, especially across the Apennine, and that uh, saw a lot of, you know, in fact, frontier warfare, raids, battles, it was pretty, pretty bloody thing. The Longobards would soon take the upper hand, basically since the beginning of the 11th, the, of the 7th century, the, the Byzantines gave up the idea of recovering the, the Italic interland because, like, the Longobards were simply bigger. Right, the Byzantines were interested in in the coasts. They they didn't have any resources to carry out a reconquest of Italy by that point. They had much more serious problems uh, strategically, and so the Longobards too were not um, uh, radically uh, aggressive at that point. They were just kind of eroding, mostly a uh, a domination that was in fact in the form of the Exarchs also essentially autonomizing from Constantinople, and growing similar to, to the Longobard. So even that sharp divide between Byzantine Italy and Longobard Italy is kind of, you know, they were pretty similar in nature as a matter of, I mean, they would grow similar in nature. Of course, there, there were important differences too, but I don't want to be, in fact, I made videos about this and I will keep making them, but um, because also Byzantine society in the, in the, from this uh, 7th, 8th century Italy is, Usually, no, you never hear about that, but it's actually important to study. Um, so, as we've seen, the Longobards centered their power in Pavia as a capital, practically. They um, wanted to reach... Uh, we're talking about the the kings at that point, at least at this beginning with Albavin and Clef. Um, the idea was to reach, at some point, the... Uh, Longobard duchy is created in the uh, Apenninic Italy with the centers of Spoleto and Benevent uh, and uh, this posed some problems because they had uh, first of all they had occupied mo most of Tuscany in the process and they had to f military force in order to reach those other duchies the Tiber line at the center of which the Byzantines maintained um, in a fortified fashion between the Pentapolis and the Duchy of Rome that was still under the Popes and the Byzantine garrison um, a stripe constituted so-called Duchy of Perusia that ran in the heart of the Apennine from the you know Tyrrhenian to the Adriatic and connected the Exarchate with Rome by the way, Benevent, I said it other times, it seems to have been Longobard, even before the, the, the Longobard people as a whole migrated into Italy, because um, there the Byzantines settled, at the end of the Gothic War, some of the Longobard mercenaries that were employed during the war that had remained. And we get that also because in the Longobard Beneventan administration we find some titles that are different from the other Longobard ones. The, the Longobards had the duchies, right? They had the, these, uh, like, as a so essentially militarized people, this idea of the dukes, of the military leader, that um, that's what gave the name eventually to the to the districts that were, that were occupied. Whereas in Benevent, there was one of the few mentions of the commas, which was much more Roman sounding in a way. And there, there is evidence that it's possible, at least that the, the, the Longobard Beneventan garrison, when the, the main Longobard mass migrated in the peninsula, kind of joined them in a sense. But they were already ruling from there in a way. Um, in any case, Constantinople, thanks to its fleet, could maintain the control on almost all the Italian coasts that were incidentally and historically the, uh, in fact, the most uh, urbanized uh, and the ones that were kind of more obviously as portal centers connected with, uh, say, the late antique uh, culture with Constantinople, some areas, especially in southern Italy, um, some cities spoke Greek as, as well as Latin, so they they were part more of that 
kind of Byzantine world and mindset. They would remain for a long time, as you know. These would autonomize, uh, autonomize themselves uh, over the centuries. In fact, some even of the earliest Italian maritime republic were born out were in the south, not much in the, what would prevail famously in the, uh, later on in, in, the, in the north or in Tuscany. Um, because of this novel vocation that was kind of uh, Byzantine and even previously Roman or even Hellenic legacy for that matter. Some of these cities were incidentally Hellenic colonies back in the day. But in, in, in this regard it's important to stress the divide that existed even at a f very few uh, distance, like a you know, few f tens of kilometers between the city and the interland. Right, this you you find this even in in the Balkans, like in the 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 Greek port and the Slavic countryside. Right, and so in Italy it was pretty much the same. And this is something that dates back, in fact, to the ancient world. It, the the example of the Hellenic colony is not random because I don't know in Italy or in Gaul, the uh, you had this Hellenic colonies on the coasts, but the interland was was not Hellenized historically that there was always this kind of different hardcore respectively italic or gallic um uh, culture was substantially different and kind of more warlike and so even with with a lot of uh, r uh, water passing under the bridges th this thing had kind of remained it had remained after all also in roman italy again the italic countryside was something the the the, the ancient Hellenic coastal colony was something else. We're literally two different worlds, two different cultures, two different languages, two different world, right? So, but of course, the on the long run, especially in medieval times, the decline of the city and the eventually the re-expansion of the uh, continental European interland, the demographic and economic force was stemmed from the countryside always. And which uh, which is the case also linguistically, right? The the eventually Greek was lost because it was just spoken in the cities, and that the, the the interland was dramatically more habitated in absolute terms, and um, that's how this brought to kind of an homogenization also of the language. Um, distant cultures, really. Like, the already great part, you see, we have, um, that's another example I make all the time, we have lamentations in letters between bishops that were exchanged in the Byzantine Italy and uh, the Byzantine Empire altogether that, that show us how the, the peasants of Byzantine Italy very often fled the Latifundia to go live in Longobard, Italy, because there the f the, the 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 colonists, the small landowners, were freer and less taxed, etc. So that's also a civilizational divide. And the Longobard Kingdom, as we we're, were saying at the beginning, would take forms that were surely more advanced and kind of articulated in a subtle sense than whatever was the Byzantine relic uh, in Italy by the 8th century, in, um, especially in this land mass sense. So this is extraordinary because you, you get to realize that the Italic populations were culturally Germanized. They literally believed at the end of the, the Longobard kingdom that they were Longobards. This is very famous in about in Ottonian times, the imperial ambassador Lutbrand of Cremona, Longobard name, a guy who actually spoke a Romance language, not a Germanic one, he said, We are proud, Longobards, Swabians, right? Because they, that was their own national identity at that point. So this is one, probably the single most overlooked cultural um, dynamics in in the history of Western civilization, even if this is not, but again, if you if you understand Italy as eventually the uh, the cradle of uh, the communes of humanism of the Renaissance, you realize that this was the kind of background that that emerged from, literally from a few centuries from there. There is 
a lot really there we will see later on um, in other videos however hopefully um, so the Byzantine talasocracy allowed uh, the Empire to organize the two blocks of the Exarchate and the Roman Duchy uh, as fundamental for the preservation of, in fact, the respect of the, of the Exarch's government in Ravenna and of a direct control, at least in initial times, on the Papacy of Rome, connecting the two blocks through the the Pentapolis and the Duchy of Perusia. Uh, this aspect is 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 fascinating also because we we don't know exactly how in, in detail at least how the the Byzantines really f let's say properly imperial control fell out fell in in these areas. Of course, it was a brutal contraction, especially with the Islamic invasions, the loss of the East. Constantinople didn't have enough money. There was a a militarization thing about the teams, etc. Um, in a sense, Italy had been or already organized in a similar way. Um, the Exarchate remained the actual head of the Italian government, uh, and we can say that it was basically the only one because even southern Italy was, again, mostly the coast. Instead, the the Exarchate still had some kind of broader territorial consistency and it protected the lagoons uh, the, the pentapolis etc the duchy of rome is also interesting because the popes were starting to have an enormous mm, moral material power already with their connection with the other romano-germanic kingdoms the evangelization of the anglo-saxons uh, the connections with especially the frankish church it was already acquiring one of those prestige, the, that prestige. Of, in fact, they they enjoyed still in the Byzantine Empire, but with with whom they began to quarrel pretty soon because the popes were kind of mm, pretty aware of their own power. The Roman Church, as we've seen also recently, had an enormous uh, estate. Uh, they controlled basically everything. And albeit initially, we know there was uh, a Byzantine contingent in Rome. By the 8th century, we see a Militia Romanorum. That is to say, these were the local Roman militias and, you know, troops. And we, that, that's a, a yet an uh, all-to-study period in history. Um, the Liber Pontificalis is the main source and it's an, an enormous amount of information but really an enormous amount on early medieval Rome that is really a special really in, in, in its quality and quantity and studying that probably would reveal a lot about how the mechanism worked there and that when the popes began in, in fact to really have something more like a territorial domination that the and, and I say it is because the Longobards actually played with that were in a sense paradoxically even though they besieged Rome twice uh, Alter at some point even deported the the Roman peasantry from around the city they, they sold them as slaves in France and all the thing but they um, they kind of enucleated the papacy in in a position to Constantinople because they realized on multiple occasions that after all the popes were kind of okay like they were becoming an ever more italic power rather than um, something more in t uh, let's say Mediterranean in nature this is what kind of eventually closed the gaps even with the Franks uh, in Italy etc but it um, th there is a letter from Gregory the Great to I think that's literally the the Roman em the Byzantine Emperor Constantinople. That's the I don't remember exactly the context. It might have been the tricapitalin uh, schism or something, uh, because as always the Byzantine Empire was trying to compromise with the, with the heresies in the eastern provinces for which they were really making a mess theologically speaking but without any meaning of frank and even the longbirds that were still formerly Aryan were actually much more orthodox in nature uh, compared to the imperial to the imperial government that, by the way was trying to enforce the same ideas in, in the same 
in the same Italy and especially on the Pope because if the Pope said it the the Byzantine emperors knew that they could claim Constantinople was special as much as they wanted but actually it was Rome that had the, the, the primacy in, in Christendom and it was about the you know saving their face also in face of this Western Romano-Germanic world that was consolidating also as a competitor and with the long birds was obvious well, in this letter, the, the, the Pope says something extremely s and subtly threatening at the same time to, to Constantinople because it tells them, because they, the Byzantines wanted to, control, to keep control of Italy, uh, this were, the Longobards were already settled. And, and the Pope says, watch out, like be careful, because if we want, I mean, with the, po the, the papacy, we can turn the tides in Italy. We can't control what happens here. We can't make you essentially... And he was referring to the Longbirds. He was basically telling them, if we want, we will side with them. And as a matter of fact, that kind of happened at some point, because the the main Longbird goal was to take over Italy entirely, and so the papacy would have... They would have not taken out the papacy. There was never such a thing. Uh, yet another myth of the Longobards is that they were furiously anti-Catholic. It's bullshit, right? They were Aryan at the beginning, as other Germans could be, uh, because that was a way to internationally divide themselves from the empire and those who were supporting it, especially when they were at war with that. But there was no, there is no mm, documented persecution in uh, in the Longobard kingdom of the Catholic clergy or anything. Some were removed, but there is no destruction, there is no killing. Archaeologically speaking, we don't see any destruction, in fact, in the Longobard lands. Just in the frontier areas, when they made war with the Byzantines on a regular basis. And the um, the idea, of course, by besieging Rome was also to make the, the papacy uh, kind of to control it. And so that was the reason why the, the popes were you know, cautious, because it's not that they, they wanted to maintain their own as always. That's why they always basically split the country in two, um, even later on. But the relations, especially from the beginning of the seventh century, were kind of nice, right? Think about Agilulf and Theodolinda. And she was, as you know, Agilulf the Longobard king, and she was uh, she was actually the widow of Authory, um, and she was Bavarian, and as a Bavarian, she was actually Catholic. She was not Aryan. Even Agilulf agreed to make uh, their son baptize the, the Catholic way. Um, and she um, held, uh, she engaged in this epistolary relation with Gregory the Great. Big names, uh, big connections. And think about St. Columba, the, the monastery creation in the Longobard kingdom. That, that, that was a big deal while the Byzantines were kind of watching, <laughs> you know, this uh, connections being re-established, right? So, uh, the entire myth of the Longobards as persecutors, etc., was in reinvented only when the Longobards, uh, you know, the, the, the popes actually allied themselves with the Franks in anti-Longobard fashion. And you know that the Carolingians at the beginning were allied with the Longobards, as we were saying before, they actually thought a big deal of them, but were, you know, solicited by the Pope to intervene in Italy. They saw that the Longobard kingdom at that point was militarily, uh, you know, uh, more, uh, say, more permeable, probably even than they would, would have thought. And so they began to toy with the idea of taking it over. That, that finished in 774 when Charlemagne conquered the kingdom. So at that point, there is a whole load of papal propaganda saying, oh, look at these, you know, heretics or whatever. At that point, the Longobards were fully Catholic. By the, yeah, by the end of the 7th, beginning of the 8th century, Longobard kingdom is fully Catholic. There's not even a, nothing uh, in terms of Arianism, zero. So it's all kind of a construction, right? It's... It's a political machination, right? The same things that the popes were saying at the end of the 6th century, at the beginning of the 7th, when the Byzantines were invading the Po Valley together with the Franks. Ah, these nefandissima gents, Langobardorum. I also made a video about that. And so, again, the an attempt of 
person that reads these things doesn't actually understand what that means but uh, this is not to say that the Longbirds who came straight out of Central Europe at, uh, in the 6th century uh, in Italy were kind of refined and mannered people let's say but um, there is a difference between that and being just you know blind uh, destroyers with no point because there is no evidence or history to it like it, it it's a complete invention and it's an idea that shouldn't be used in any way nor and, and it's for unfortunately it's done from one side those who defend the Byzantines say, ah, this, uh, you know, the Dongbers were just uh, brutal barbarians and their developed monsters killed, they destroyed everybody. Ah, everything ended when they arrived. It's complete bullshit. On the other hand, there are the, the uh, you know, the, the, the white suprematistic ultra Germanists who said, ah, you know, finally the, the, the Dongbers arrived, killed everybody, enslaved all the Romans, destroyed every. No, this is bullshit in, in equal proportion. So what actually happened was much bigger. And. Yet, as we were saying, in popular culture, there is practically no no realization of this. I, I may be easily the, the only person who talks about this on YouTube, frankly, because I've, I've given a look to, to other videos on Longobard history, and they still do revolve, actually, either on the very first phase of the invasion, not even these other, the process of the creation, and the, the kingdom establishment, etc., and, and the end, like the Carolingian conquest. So... I think it's a very superficial approach. I, I think one month ago or so, I began also to talk about something more social about um, Longobard Italy that is fortunately documented. Again, this is uh, for early medieval standards a dramatically documented reality, uh, easily, and, and so we are lucky enough to have so much, and so much will probably be done not just by history still that has to always revisit the spirit but also archaeologically speaking because very often people who go um, to places like Italy like these uh, most evidently classical legacy places etc they they hardly invest money for searching for early medieval stuff they all want to want to find the Roman stuff um, and and so some t uh, we we are actually realizing for those who study early medieval history and archaeology that there is literally a wholly brand new history that has to be written about these countries that to say more or less we think what it was like i don't know early medieval italy no we don't that is we we know fortunately a lot about general things but if we were to dig we would find cities, entire cities, that we didn't even know they existed, that are there, that were, you know, living, that were active, whereas that were, by the way, going on in ways which are dramatically uh, continuative with late antiquity. Just yet another thing that, generally speaking, the Western historiography is not being interested in because it's being mostly Anglo-Saxon dominated has mostly bought in the idea that these were kind of the dark ages because objectively Britain did really have the worst in terms of old post-Roman Europe. Um, and so in terms of properly of not even worse in the sense of necessary of the destructions, but properly in terms of fact of what we can know historically, there's much less. Um, and so also the other countries by cultural hegemony have to be interpreted like that. When you study Southern Europe especially, you realize that it that it's as if late antiquity is only debatably finishing there. It's mostly like a, a, a convention. I personally buy the concept because uh, I did see a contraction, it's important, etc. But again, we also express this judgment on the basis of what still we don't kind of don't don't have an evidence for when things come out and you realize that they hint at a direction univocally, well and this direction is op the opposite one you've been told up to this point. Well, that's where you start saying, well, that's the big things that we still need to rewrite. And again, sometimes I read uh, manuals from different countries and I realize that, but if those are things that people study at university and the importance and the hierarchy um, that they attribute to the importance of single 
topics historically, culturally. I think that we have messed up seriously our entire educational system from quite a long time. And to the point we, we don't even realize anymore the, the, the scale of the mistake. And that's a big issue. And studying these periods are, is, um, is, really, um, is really eloquent that way. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah, we made it another, I don't know, two hours video about the longbirds, which I'm always pleased to make, but um, we will make lots of other ones about longbirds, hopefully, and I think especially that we haven't told before. For now, I stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. See you next time. Bye.